Come on, clap louder for Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Good to see you guys and uh, great to bring God's word to you once again. Are you happy to be in the house of God? Hallelujah. Why don't we just take a moment to pray and just ask the Lord to speak to us uh, this afternoon. How, how about we do this? Why don't we take one of our hands and place it upon our hearts and the other hand just lift it up to the Lord because we have been talking about hungering for God. We've been talking about asking God for more. So this very moment as we come to hear His word, we want to ask the Lord for more even as we come and listen to Him. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I want to thank you that your presence is here with us. We just want to ask even right now as our hands are placed upon our hearts, as the other hand is open up to you, Lord, that is our way of telling you, Jesus, that we want more of your presence. That's our way of telling you, Jesus, that we desire more of you. And Lord, we just ask that you will come right now into our midst and just remove uh, every distraction that's in our mind, everything that's weighing heavy upon our hearts, Lord, you will just come and cause all these distractions to be removed so that God, even as we listen to your word, we will receive not just in our minds, but we will receive something that will change our hearts. We thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, Amen, Amen. You know, how many of you were here at youth service uh, last Saturday? Wave at me, right? And how many of you felt that last Saturday as we came to youth service, when Pastor Daniel came to bring us the word, it was something so powerful and special. Wave at me and make some noise. Right? And last week, Pastor Daniel came and brought us a very, very important word from God. And he talked to us about being what? Being hungry for God. Being hungry for God. And he taught us these two important truths, that in our Christian lives, we must be hungry for God, and we must cultivate, number one, holy discontent that develops our spiritual hunger. Everybody say, holy discontent. Come on, ten times louder, say, holy discontent. He talked to us about having a holy discontent that develops a spiritual hunger in us. And not only that, number two, he talked to us about cultivating a holy desire that determines our spiritual food. Everybody say together with me, holy desire. Now, I've been a Christian for, wow, very, very long, uh, since primary four. And I've learned this very important truth. One of the most powerful prayers that we can ever pray for our Christian lives consists of two words. And the two words are, more, Lord. More, Lord. Can you turn to your friend and say to them, more, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. And I want you to say more, Lord, to your friend in a, in a way like you really want it, right? That you really want more. It's like some yummy food that you're eating or some great stuff that you're enjoying and you want more of that, okay? Turn to your friend and say to them, more, Lord, more, Lord, in a way that really, really expresses that desire. All right, at the count of three, let's do it. One, two, three, more, Lord, more, Lord. And that's really the cry of our hearts, that we want more of Jesus, more than the things of this world. And so, as we think about hungering for God, as we think about wanting more of the Lord, this week at youth service and including next week as well, we're going to talk about this whole aspect of worship, all right? This whole aspect of worship. Because if we, if we want to talk about being hungry for God, if we want to talk about having more of God in our lives and hungering for the things of God, then this whole aspect of God's presence, this whole aspect of cultivating a heart of worship is very, very important in our Christian lives. So this afternoon, the sermon is entitled, Cultivate Heart of Worship. Cultivate Heart of Worship. Let's turn our Bibles uh, to Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to read from verses 35 to 39. And if you do not have your Bibles with you, you can refer to the uh, verses on the screen. Matthew 22, verses 35 to 39. And the Word of God says, One of them, an expert in the law, tested him, Jesus, right, with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. Today we're going to talk about cultivating a heart of worship. Now when we talk about the whole aspect of worship, you know, this, this whole aspect of worship is very much misunderstood 
in our Christian world today or in our Christian lives today, right? When I, when I talk about worship or when we mention the word worship, some of us may think about, well, worship uh, has to do with praying uh, or worship has to do with taking the Lord's Supper. And for many, many Christians, when you talk about worship, the first thing that comes into our mind is this whole aspect of singing or just uh, music, etc., etc., or going to church is part of worship. Well, listen to me carefully. Worship includes all these things, but worship is actually more than all these things. And, and unfortunately, sometimes we are caught up with what we call the forms or the styles of worship. And especially in our, in our world today, among us who are young people, many of us, when we talk about worship, we are caught up with what I call the products of worship, you know, the products of worship, the, the music, the albums, the Christian music that we listen to, the song list that we have on Spotify, so on and so forth. And, and the Christian world is filled with many, many products of worship. Now, don't get me wrong. These are not bad things. These are not wrong things. These are, in fact, things that will help us in our worship. But worship is more than just the products of worship. And I remember many years ago, I visited the United States and I went to uh, Dallas, Texas. How many of you have heard of Dallas, Texas? Or the only Texas you know is Texas Fried Chicken. Okay. We went to Dallas, Texas. And Dallas, Texas is like the Christian belt of the USA, the Christian belt of the United States. And I remember going down this street and on this, on this particular street, there were houses, little, little uh, houses, like kind of landed property, houses after houses of Christian recording studios. Okay? And, and the person who brought us there was telling us, all these houses are Christian recording studios, producing Christian albums, and there are so many of them. And, 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 and some of us will know that, you know, in the, in the Christian world, Christian music, Christian worship music is a big, massive uh, product. Uh, that, 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 that is important. Well, these are not wrong things, but when we come to think about worship or having the heart of worship, it is more than all these things. It is more than lifting our hands. It's, it's more than what are the worship songs we have loaded uh, on our handphones, so on and so forth. So when we talk about the heart of worship, when we talk about having a heart of worship or cultivating a heart of worship, what do we mean? And, and I really, really love this definition given, us, given to us by this man called David Mathis. He says this, listen carefully. The heart of worship is our heart delighting in Jesus and expressing praise to Him. He's at the center. He's the focus. It is His commands we consider first, not our preferences. I'm going to read this definition again. It's a little bit long, but receive every word that's being said here, alright? And let it let it sing into our hearts and our minds. It says, the heart of our worship, or the heart of worship, is our heart delighting in Jesus and expressing praise to Him. He is at the center. He's the focus. It is His commands that we consider first, not our preferences. So when we talk about the heart of worship, it is not the products of worship. It's not just what we do in worship, but it is what Jesus and His Word defines for us as true worship. Amen? And this afternoon, we want to learn what is really the whole aspect of true worship. And we want to answer this question this afternoon. How do we cultivate in our Christian lives a heart of true worship? Can you turn to your friend and tell them, God wants you to cultivate a heart of true worship. Turn to the other friend and tell them, God wants you to cultivate a heart of true worship. Tell them ten times louder, okay? God wants you to cultivate a heart of true worship. So how do we cultivate a heart of true worship? To cultivate a heart of true worship, number one, we must live out the purpose of worship through extravagant love. To cultivate a heart of true worship, firstly, we must live out the purpose of worship through extravagant love. In the in the verses that we have just read in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus says this as the very first thing, okay? He says this as the very first thing. Love the Lord your God. Can you read together with me that verse that's on the screen? Love the Lord your God. Now listen to me, young people. At the very core 
of worship, right? At the very core of worship, when we strip away all the forms, when we, when we strip away all the sophistication, at the very core, at the very center of worship, it is all about loving God. The heart of worship is the heart of God's people. It is our hearts loving Jesus. It's all about loving God. It's all about loving Jesus. And listen to me very carefully. It is important that we understand that this is the very purpose of our lives. You and I exist. This is the very, very purpose of our life. You and I exist to love God. Can you turn to your friend and tell them, you, buddy, exist to love God. You exist to love God. I exist to love God. And we must capture and understand this purpose of our lives. That the purpose of our life, the, the, the key purpose of our life is to love God. And, and if you want to know the purpose of your life, you know, some people, when they want to know the purpose of their lives, they will go and take part in a talk show. They may read some self-help books. You know, when you, when you go to popular bookshop and you look at, the, the array of books there, there are many books on self-help, right? Discovering yourself, discovering your purpose. Well, these are not necessarily wrong, but if you really, really want to know the purpose of your life, don't just go to a talk show, don't just read up on books, don't just Google. If you want to know the purpose of your life, go to the source, go to the manual, right? If you want to know how your handphone works, how does your handphone function, what is it supposed to do, or this new product or this new gadget they have bought, if you want to know how it works and what's its purpose, you need to read the manual. You need to go back to the originator, right? You need to go to the creator of the person who made that product to find out what is the purpose of the thing that you're using. Likewise, the purpose of our lives to really, really understand, we need to go back to the source. We need to go to the Creator. And the manual for that is the Word of God, is the Bible. And the Bible tells us this, listen carefully, and this is an important thing to understand right at the start of this sermon. You and I were made by God and we were made for God. You and I were made by God and we were made for God. Let it sink into our hearts. And Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 tells us this, God created everything and it is for His pleasure that they exist and were created. If you are taking notes, can you write down this line there? I am made for God's pleasure. Okay? Make sure you spell correctly. Huh? I am made for God's pleasure, not I am made for God's pressure. Okay, just in case uh, you forgot how to spell pleasure. I am made for God's pleasure. And this is an incredible truth, young people listen to it. This is an incredible truth. You and I were created for God. You and I were created for God's pleasure. In other words, you and I were created for God's enjoyment. And God made you and God made me for His enjoyment so that He could enjoy us. And God delights to look at our lives and to see our lives being lived out for Him. And that is why last weekend's sermon is so important that our Christian lives is all about hungering for God and more of Him. That our Christian lives is all all about just giving ourselves not just to the things of this world or put aside the things of this world, but our lives are, should be given to hungering for God and more of Him. So the highest purpose of our lives, young people, is that God wants us to love Him back. He wants you and He wants me to bring enjoyment back through Him through extravagant love and worship. Take a moment and look at this quote. Once again, God wants us to love Him back. He wants us, you and I, to bring enjoyment back to Him through extravagant love and worship. Wow, this is an incredible truth. Okay, can you take your finger and just wave at me like that? All right, and then point at yourself. Okay, don't poke your friend. Point at yourself and say, I am made for God's pleasure. And then say this, I am made for God's enjoyment. 
Now, when we do that, some of us say, no, la, cannot be me. La. You know, God, I don't bathe a lot. I don't brush my teeth in the morning when, when I'm going to do my devotion. You know, how, how could it be? But that's the truth of the Bible. It's, it's, it's not the, these are not the words of Pastor Roland. These are the words of the Bible. That I, that you are made for God's enjoyment. You are made for God's pleasure. Okay? So let's do that one more time to remind ourselves. Say, I... Point to yourself and made for God's pleasure. And can you turn to your friend and give them a smile? Like you're very pleased with them. Okay. And you can ask your friend to give you a treat for dinner later. <laughs> now, when we think about this, some of you say, Pastor, you sabot us, okay. But when we think about this truth that, okay. I need to give God extravagant love, okay? I need to give God uh, pleasure and joy through my worship, okay, right? And some of us think about this, and, but some of us kind of, kind of struggle, and, and even in my own life, I struggled for a long time. Huh? Must give God extravagant love, you know? Uh, why? Uh? Can, can we just give Him ordinary love? Uh, can we just give him sufficient love? Why must we give him extravagant love? Well, listen to this truth. Listen to this truth. And we need to understand this truth. We give to God extravagant love because he has first given us his extravagant love. And the Bible tells us in 1 John 3, 1, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God, and this is what we are. Listen to Pastor Roland, and we're going to read this verse one more time, but listen to me carefully. The truth is that in ourselves, in our human, normal, selfish selves, we are not capable, or we are not inclined, we are not prone to giving God extravagant love. In fact, in our human nature, we are not even inclined to love God, right? And the only way you and I can love God and to love God extravagantly, and the word here is extravagantly, is that we ourselves have received the extravagant love of God in our lives. So we're going to read this verse in 1 John 3, one, one more time, okay? At the count of three. One, two, three. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And this is what we are. And this word, lavish, means wasting it on someone, okay? This word, lavish, if you will check out the dictionary, it means extravagant. God Himself first gave to us His extravagant love. God Himself first gave to us His lavish love. He's the one who first poured it out upon us. And I want to share this with you. For a long time, I, for a long time as a Christian, as I was growing up, I, I know this truth in my head. Okay, yeah lah, you know, God loves us lavishly. God loved me extravagantly. He loved me very, very much, you know. And I, and I knew it as a kind of thing in my mind. But I really, really understand this truth maybe just probably about 10 years back when the Lord gave to me a powerful revelation and a powerful encounter of what it means when He said, or when he says that he poured out his love lavishly upon me. And I remember it was in an encounter weekend, and now you call it life class. It was an encounter weekend. And I was actually one of those teaching the encounter weekend. And, and the, in our encounter weekend, there's this portion called, you know, the cross, okay? Talking about the cross of Jesus, experiencing and encountering the cross of Jesus. So I was, I was teaching this lesson, you know, teaching the lesson as a, a, a good, any good pastor would be teaching. And then I led the young people, you know, that I was teaching into a time of ministry. And I remember as we were going to a time of ministry, I closed my eyes and I was saying, oh, let's, let's focus on Jesus. Suddenly, I saw in my, in my mind, okay, uh, it was not like being transported to anywhere, but I saw in my mind a very, very clear vision of Jesus hanging on the cross. And when I saw of that vision of Jesus hang on the cross, what I saw was just His blood, all right? He was, he was hanging on the cross all bloody already, right? We know that He was being whipped, 
We know that Jesus was being nailed to the cross, his hands and his feet. We knew that he was being whipped and there was a crown of thorns. He was just hanging there, nailed to the cross. I saw a vision of that. And I saw so much blood just flowing. And I said, God, this is, this is so bloody. You know? This is so terrible. Jesus is shedding so much blood on the cross. Why, why, why? And as if it was not enough, that he was, he, blood was already flowing from his hands, from his feet, from his crown of thorns, and every part of as if it was not enough. I then saw the vision, as the Bible records for us, of a soldier taking a spear to pierce the side of Jesus. Right? And when that spear went in, those of us who know him, but when that spear went in through his side, the Bible tells us that from his side, the blood began to gush out and float and every drop of blood together with water was just drained from the body of Jesus Christ. And I was looking at that in my mind, I was looking at the vision, I said, God, why so much blood? Why, why, why is Jesus shedding so much blood? Isn't just that suffering of, of being whipped, of being nailed, is it not enough? Why is there so much blood? And I saw that spear go in by the side of Jesus and blood just started to flow and flow and flow and every drop of the blood of Jesus was being drained from his body and I was just crying. I was saying, God, why? Why must Jesus bleed so much? Why must every drop of his blood be drained from his body? Jesus, why? 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 And it was in that moment that I understood when the Lord says that he lavished his love upon us, when the Lord says that he waste, in a sense, all of His love upon us. He was not just giving us a statement. He demonstrated it because every single drop of blood was drained from the body of Jesus Christ to show us how much God has lavished His love upon us. And you know, only in the Christian faith do we have a Saviour who shed every drop of blood for you and for I, and for me. And listen to me, young people. If you ever doubt that God does not love you extravagantly, if you ever doubt that God does not love you lavishly, look to the cross, look to Jesus, because every single drop of blood was drained for you, for you, for you, for you, and for me. And the encounter with Jesus, even though I was a trainer, okay, I taught it like so many times, but that encounter that when I saw that vision forever changed my life because every drop represents the lavish love of God for us and for the world whom He loves. And you know why every drop of blood has to be drained from the body of Jesus Christ? You know why? So that the sins of men and women, past, present, even our future sins that we have yet to be committed, all these can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Wow. Can we go ahead and give the Lord a big clap of praise? Come on, really, really clap to Him, right? Amen. His blood every drop of it represents the extravagance of His love for you. And if you ever, ever doubt that, ask God to show you a fresh vision of His love for you. Well, maybe some of us think, huh, pastor, I feel like a slave, you know, when, when you tell me that I'm created for God's pleasure. Uh, I feel that like a slave, like, huh, no choice one, you know. Uh, I am created to delight the Lord. It, it feels kind of like that. Well, just listen to Pastor for a while, okay? Listen to me. God loves us, amen? God loves us, and let me assure you, God will never force you to worship Him. God will never force you to worship Him. God will never go against your choice or your will to worship Him because He loves you. He gives you a free will. He will never violate that free will. He did not make you a robot, okay? 
He did not make you an AI, okay? He made you to be you. He made you to have freedom. He will never compel you. He will never force you to worship, okay? Some of you, if you don't believe me, okay, you can remain sitting there. The, the next time we sing a song of praise, you can remain sitting there. You won't see a force push you up and cause you to jump up and down, okay? It's not going to happen that way. You're not going to see a force lift up your hands. No, I don't want, no, I don't want. And God is forcing you, come, you must worship. Okay, it's not going to happen that way because he loves you. It's a free choice. But yet, he says, come and worship me. Come and bring joy to me because this is what I've created you for. And if you ever doubt his lavish love, look to how much he has lavished first his love upon you. And it's, but there's a very important perspective in how we see this, this, uh, this point about our purpose is, is that we are made to worship God. It's a very important perspective, okay? And, and I like how Rick Warren uh, puts it. This is what he says. To bring enjoyment to God is the first purpose of your life. And listen to what he says. This proves your worth. You are that important to God. Leave that quote there for a while and read it one more time. To bring enjoyment to God is the first purpose of your life. And some of us feel like we are slaves, we are forced to do it. It's against my choice. But listen, look at it from another perspective. The fact that the God of heaven and earth, the fact that the King of kings, the fact that we have an all-powerful God, He says, you are made for my enjoyment. This is the purpose of your life. What does this tell us? This tells us that we are worth something to God, that we are important to God. Can you turn to your friend and say to them, you are so important to God, friend. You are so important to God. And because you are so important to God, He gives to you this privilege to worship Him. Amen. So young people, the next time we come into youth service to worship God, when you walk in, lift up your head high and say, it's cool. I'm going to worship God. And that's how important I am. Okay? And, uh, and uh, the next time you're going to come to youth service and someone says, hey, don't go lah. Come, I show you go for gaming. I show you for uh, some other kind of thing, sports. And you say, no, 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 cannot. You know, I'm the VIP for an event at Nicole at Suntech. I'm a VIP. I'm a very important person. You say, how are you so important? Now can you wear shorts and t-shirt? No, I'm very important. Even though I'm wearing shorts and t-shirt, I'm so important because I'm going into this place where I'm going to worship God and He has given me that privilege to worship Him. He has given me the high purpose of worshipping Him and I am a very important person that, that needs to fulfill my purpose and I come before God to worship Him because He's worth it. Amen? Come on, go ahead and give Jesus a big clap of praise. Oh, come on, if you want to clap, really, really clap for Him. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are important to God. And we need to live out our purpose through extravagant love in our worship. Now, perhaps some of us are saying, hey, pastor, okay, I will, I will worship God with, uh, with, with love, uh, yeah, extravagance, you know. But can I don't be uh, so expressive or not? Can, can I don't need to lift, lift up my hands or not? Very, very paise, la. you know, some of us still struggling to lift up our hands, like very weird to do so, you know. Um, but remember this, okay? God says to love Him with all, everybody say all, say all loudly, all. God says to love Him with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. All means all, all means everything, all means to the maximum, to the best of our abilities. Remember this quote that I gave you? The heart of worship is our heart. Delighting in Jesus, expressing praise to Him. He is at the center. He's the focus. And this part, it is His commands we consider first, not our preferences. So young people ask me, Hey, pastor, must be expressive one, our worship. Must be extravagant one, our worship. Uh, can I be extravagant without being expressive? In really extravagant, okay, in my worship without expressing anything. Well, listen to me. Just in case we are doubtful, 
Just in case we are wondering, is it really true that we must be extravagant and expressive in showing our love to Jesus? The Lord gave us an account in the Bible. Okay? And this account in the Bible talks about this woman who was extravagant in her love for Jesus. So I'm going to ask uh, two persons to help me to make it a little bit more interesting. Can we put our hands firstly to welcome Jesus on stage, all right? Jesus. Jesus, great to have you. Can you hurry up? <laughs> okay, no, just kidding. And the Bible records for us, and you can open your Bible to Luke chapter 7, verses 44. The Bible records for us that, that Jesus had an encounter with a woman, right? And the Bible tells us that Jesus was in the presence of Pharisees. So we have Jesus, and all of us here are Pharisees, okay? Just to help me out a little bit. I'm sorry, but that's the best role I can give to you. And the Bible tells us that Jesus was in the presence of some Pharisees. And then came a woman... And the Bible was very specific that this woman was a sinful woman. Okay, this woman was a sinful woman. And women of that day in their culture had nothing to do with men. Not only do they have nothing to do with men, if they, if they are sinful women, they cannot even come near men or even religious leaders. So this sinful woman, yet this sinful woman came. So sinful woman, please come. She was... She was sinful. She was shameful. She was, she was kind of like just totally wrecked by the fact that she's in the presence of Pharisees, in the presence of many, many men. Some of them probably tikope. But the Bible tells us she, she came to Jesus because she could see in Jesus his eyes of extravagant love. And the Bible tells us he came to Jesus Christ. And this woman came to Jesus. She, she crawled to Jesus. A woman, you can hurry up. Also. <laughs> okay, but... <laughs> Never mind, they're doing well. Come on, let's clap for them. And the Bible records for us, she, she came to Jesus and she was at the feet of Jesus. And she wanted to wash the feet of Jesus. Uh, Jesus... She wants to wash your feet, not your shoes. So, I need your help. Yeah. And, and, and the shoes and the sandals of those days were just dirty because it was, it was in a Palestinian context and it was sand and mud. And when Jesus entered the house, how about the socks? When Jesus entered the house, no one washed his feet which was supposed to be the custom of that day, okay? You're supposed to wash the feet. Now listen to me. I don't know whether cameras are capturing this, but listen to me. If you can't see, you can kind of like, I don't know, just stretch a bit. The Bible tells us very specifically, what did this woman do? No one washed the feet of Jesus, but this woman started to wet the feet of Jesus with her tears. With her tears. She must have cried so much. So much. And her tears were enough to wipe the feet of Jesus. And she started to wipe the feet of Jesus that were wet with her tears, with her hair, with her long hair. And she was wiping it. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm so moved. Jasper and Charmaine, today on, from today onwards, your marriage has gone a few notches up. But she was wiping, okay, wiping his feet with her hair. And not only that, she kissed his feet. She kissed his feet. Stand by the ambulance. Huh? <laughs> and then, now listen, then she did this. She was holding an expensive jar of, uh, it's a scented oil, which is like perfume. And this jar of scented oil probably cost 
a lot of money. She probably saved a lot of it. And the Bible tells us she broke it and she poured it at the feet of Jesus. And she continued to wipe his feet. She continued to just express her love. Now, imagine with me, okay, you can see them here. Imagine Jesus could have said, hey, hey, enough. Stop. You, you are a woman. This, this, this is disgraceful for you. Hey, hey, woman, enough, enough. Stop, stop. But, you, but listen, Jesus did not tell her to stop. Jesus did not stop her. Jesus did not tell her that it was enough. Jesus continued to let her express her love extravagantly to him. And, she, and he said this, her many sins have been forgiven because her great love, you, you can read the Bible, because her great love has been shown because her extravagant love has been shown. Let's thank Charmaine, Pastor Charmaine and, and uh, Jasper. All right. If tonight there's any problem in your marriage, just call Pastor Kwang Han, okay? <laughs> he will help you. But listen to Pastor Roland, listen. They did great, right? Yeah. There's one word there's only one word to describe what the woman did. Extravagant. Extravagant or extravagance. Extreme, unusual, unreasonable. For this woman who was sinful, for this woman who was broken, she showed extravagance. And what she did was recorded in the Bible for us out of so many other things that the Bible could have recorded. The Bible recorded for us that this woman did that. And when she was doing that, wiping the feet of Jesus with her hair, with her tears that were just being poured out like, like an ending and flowing, and the tears were so much that it was enough to wipe the feet, she broke the expensive jar at the feet of Jesus, she kissed the feet of Jesus. She did everything to show her extravagant love for Jesus, and Jesus did not stop her. Why? Because this is recorded for you and I, young people, that our love for God needs to be extravagant because His love for us was or is extravagant. And the powerful picture is this. The woman shed tears for Jesus to wipe His feet. But later, Jesus shed every drop of His blood for this woman to wipe her clean of her sin so that she can become a daughter of God. Come on, go ahead and give Jesus praise right now. Oh, come on, you want to clap for him? Clap for him. So when we come into the house of God and we are expressionless and we are half-hearted and we just give God a just token kind of thing, we don't feel like expressing, we don't feel like being extravagant, that means we have forgotten how much Jesus has done for us when He shed His blood for us on the cross. And this woman did that, did just that because she understands how much she has been forgiven. So to cultivate a heart of worship, you and I need to come back to loving God so much and loving God so extravagantly. I don't know. I wonder whether at this youth service we can come to a point where we worship God so loud where we cry out to God so loudly that people on the outside, even the doors are closed, they will say, what's happening in there? Is that a rock concert going in there? Is there a disco going on in there? What are all these noises of people crying, people shouting? What are all these noises? And when they open the door, they see a group of young people loving Jesus extravagantly because God has first extravagantly loved us. Can we believe God for that? and say, God, we're going to worship you so strong and so hard that we will bring the house down. You know, whenever we have youth service here, there's all this anime kind of thing happening always, right? How many of you went? Okay, don't need to raise your hand, okay? 
Can we worship God so extravagantly that they say, hey, forget about enemy, I'm going to come in here. I want to know Jesus Christ. Come on, go ahead and give Jesus a big clap right now. <coughs> That's why I love the lyrics of this song that we have been singing. I don't even know whether I can sing it because I'm losing my voice. Is extravagant. It doesn't make sense. Join me. We'll never comprehend the way you love us. It's unthinkable. Only heaven knows just how far you go to say you love us. To say you love us, to say you love us. Why don't we sing this again? It's extravagant, it doesn't make sense. We'll never comprehend the way you love us. It's unthinkable, only heaven knows how far you go. Heaven knows, heaven knows, heaven knows how much blood Jesus shed for God to say that He loves us. On the day that Jesus shed blood, all of heaven probably stood still. All the angels probably stood still because they are shocked by the fact that the Son of God is shedding blood for a sinful people. Even angels do not have that privilege, but we do. And God shed and lavished extravagantly every drop of blood for you and for me. So young people, when we come to worship, when we want to cultivate the heart of worship, can we tell God, God, today, beginning today, I'm going to love you extravagantly. Even if my friends call me xiao or crazy, I don't care. Because if you didn't tell that woman to stop, why should I stop? Because of pressure. Come on, go ahead and give Jesus a big clap of praise right now. How do we cultivate a heart of worship, true worship? To cultivate a heart of true worship, we must live out what? The purpose of worship through extravagant love. Extra. Number two, I need to move very quickly. To cultivate a heart of true worship, we must live out the practice of worship. True extreme submission. True extreme submission. Jesus replied in Matthew 22 verses 37 to 38, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest, what's that word there? Commandment. Everybody say it together with me. Commandment. Come on, ten times louder. Commandment. All my heart, all my soul. Commandment. We need to understand this. To worship God and to worship God the way He wants to be worshipped is not an option, it is a commandment. It is not a good suggestion, it is a commandment. To love God extravagantly with all of our hearts, with all of our being, is not just a good suggestion, it's not just a nice thing that is uh, given to us to do, it is a commandment. It is a commandment given to us. It has nothing to do with whether we feel like doing it or not. It has nothing to do with what is our personal opinion or options about it. It is all about a commandment. The heart of worship is our heart. Delighting in Jesus, it is His commands that we consider first, not our preferences. And when we talk about worship as a commandment, the heart of worship as a commandment, it goes beyond just a lovey-dovey kind of emotional feeling. It goes beyond just singing some songs to feel good. All right, listen. The practice of worship involves not just feeling good, not just singing, but involves devotion, it involves discipline. Now, what do I mean by the practice of worship? What do I mean by this term, the practice of worship? Practice, if you look at this word practice, 
Practice requires action rather than just thoughts or ideas. It requires action. So when we talk about the practice of worship, it requires action. We don't just think about worship. We don't just uh, have great thoughts about worship. We don't just have a theological understanding of worship or what is the right thing to do in worship. Worship involves action. Practice involves action. Practice also means doing something regularly in order to be able to do it better. How many of you believe that God is a great God? Come on, make some noise. How many of you believe that our God is, is the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Come on, make some noise. If our God is a great God, if our God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, dare we give Him half past six worship? Dare we give Him worship that is like, like, uh, like just half-hearted, that is, that is just like, like um, not committed at all? No, we will not. We would not. We want to do and we want to keep doing worship in a way that will please Him. We want to make our worship better and better because God deserves our best. The practice of true worship, listen young people, because it is a commandment, requires devotion, dedication and discipline. It requires devotion, dedication, and discipline. L look at Pastor Roland for a while. One of the greatest concerns that we have as pastors and leaders for this generation is that often we are yo-yo Christians. Our Christian faith and our commitment is a yo-yo. Meaning what? A yo-yo goes down, a yo-yo comes up, right? A yo-yo goes down, a yo-yo comes up. And our Christian lives are often down and up, up and down. Why? Because our Christian lives are, are lived out in a very shallow way. It's determined by how we feel that day or how great the atmosphere is or how the atmosphere is not so great. We are up and we are down. We are up and we are down. But true worship, to cultivate a heart of true worship, requires devotion, dedication and discipline. And that is why it requires for us to come in complete submission and obedience to God through the practice of worship. You see, discipline worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves and attend to the presence of God. Discipline worship or worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves and attend to the presence of God. Listen, by nature... We love to give attention to television. By nature, we love to give attention to Netflix. By nature, we love to give attention to gaming. By nature, we, by nature, we love to give our attention to social media. By nature, we like to give our attention to all these things. Listen to Pastor Roland very carefully. When you give attention and you give a lot of attention and time and effort to anything, social media, gaming, Netflix, whatever, when you give attention to all these things, more than you give attention to God, the Bible has one word for all these things. It's called idolatry. Whenever we give attention to something more than we give attention to God, it is called idolatry. And that is why we need to come back to being disciplined in our devotion, in our worship for God. So what are some ways that we can do it? Well, the Bible says, we love God, we worship God thoughtfully with my mind. Everybody say, with my mind. With my mind. We love God thoughtfully with our mind. And how do we, how do we do that? You know, somebody once said this, attention is an incredible expression of love. Attention is an incredible expression of love. So we need to discipline ourselves. We need to bring our, our, our lives and our focus to a disciplined giving of attention to God, thoughtfully with our mind. Well, there are just two suggestions here for us or two things that we can practice. Number one, establish a daily devotion with God. Establish a de daily devotion with God. That is part of our worship. The worship is not just when we gather together as a big group here, but our worship is on a personal, daily basis. And the Bible tells us Jesus did that. In Mark 1.35, very early in the morning while it was dark, Jesus got up, 
left the house and went to a solitary place where he prayed. The very first thing in the morning, Jesus got up and gave priority and his attention to God. And I want to encourage you, give priority in your worship, give priority of your attention and devotion to God on a daily basis. Now, let me just do a quick survey, okay? How many of you here, you have, and maybe you miss some days, it doesn't matter, but you do have a daily devotional time with God? Can you lift your hands? All right, it's great. How many of you want to do it, okay? Okay. How many of you, not too sure, but it doesn't matter, all right? Now, let me then ask you a next question. How many of you here in your daily devotion, you do it as the, f- as the first thing in the morning? How many of you do it as the first thing at night before you go to sleep? Now, some months ago, I, I was in NUS and this guy came to talk to me. He's not from our church. He was from another church. And he came to talk to me because he knew I was a pastor. And he asked me, and he said, Pastor, can you help me? You know, I'm really, I'm really, really terrible at my devotion. I just can't do my devotion regularly. And he knows that he needed to do his devotion. And he was a new believer. And he asked me, Pastor, help me, help me. Uh, how come I can't do my devotion regularly? How come I do, can't do my devotion? And I asked him a very simple question. I asked him this question. I say, young man, okay, to me, all guys are young. And I look at him and say, let me ask you this question. In your devotion, do you do it in first thing in the morning or do you do it last thing at night? That means you finish everything, then you do your devotion at night. He says, I do it the last thing at night. My devotion is done at night. And I say, often, and I ask him the next question. So oftentimes, when you do your devotion as the last thing at night, you find that you can't concentrate, you find that you're tired, you find that you give up and you skip, right? He says, yeah. Pastor, how come you know? Wow, you're a prophet. Okay. And I said, it's very simple. It's very simple. Because you put devotional time with God as the last thing, therefore it becomes the least priority. You have, ener- you have used up all your energy throughout the day. You have given your attention to every other thing in your studies, whatever else is happening. You have given all your attention to these things. Then you come to the very last part of the day where you're the, you're, you're the most tired, etc., least energy left, and you try to give it to God, your devotion, no wonder you will miss. And I told him, and I encouraged him, and I say, why don't you try to give God first priority? First thing when you get up, do it. Now, some of you say, huh, really must be in the morning, can it not be at night, etc.? Well, I'm giving you a principle, Okay. I'm giving you a principle. If you make devotion, if you make worship least priority, you will, you will keep missing it. You, you will become least priority because you made it the least priority. So the principle here is this. What would help you make your devotion the highest priority? Okay? What would help you? When you get to school, before assembly starts, you want to spend time with God, etc., etc., think of what would help you to put God first and make it a disciplined, important priority. And that was what I did as a student. First thing in the morning, early in the morning, I would spend time with God. But for you, it could be, it could be well, if at night works for you and say, in the night time is really my priority time. Night time is my most energized time. Well, then that, that principle works for you. But the key thing here is make it a priority. So, thoughtfully with our mind, we establish a daily devotion with God. Number two, Develop constant conversation with God as a discipline of our worship. And the Bible tells us in Psalms 105 verse 4, worship God continually. And this this I'm going to mention very quickly. If we want to cultivate a heart of worship, don't come and worship God just during cell meetings. Don't come and worship God just during youth service. Worship God constantly. Develop a daily conversation with the Lord. Worship God constantly, consistently. And, and, I, and, I, and I tell you, it will make a big difference. Whether is it in school, whether is it during uh, lessons, in the in-between times, whether is it during your, even, even in, your, in your recreation, etc., etc., develop a conversation with God. And keep checking in with Jesus. Keep checking in and worshipping the Lord. And this is something that I do constantly in my life. 
whether I'm driving, whether I'm showering, whether I'm just taking a, a walk or just doing something, I'll say, God, I, I want to say that I love you. God, I want to say that you are the most important person in my life. God, I just want to say that I want to extravagantly love you. I just keep checking in with God. Can you turn to your friend and say to them, hey, keep checking in with God to worship Him. Okay? Keep doing that. And this is a very, very important discipline. Many of us, we wait till Saturday come and then we try to check in with God. And, and there's just that, that sense of unfamiliarity with Him, right? But if you keep checking in with God, if you keep checking in with Him, and if you keep spending time with Him constantly, when, when we come together, that sense of God's presence will be so much stronger. So we worship God in our personal devotional life as a discipline. I want to mention something very quickly and then I will bring the whole sermon to a close. Not only do we worship God in a disciplined way on a personal basis, when we come together to worship God, and this is the truth that I learned the very first day, in a sense, when I came to FCBC, is this. We, when we come to worship God together, we don't worship God our way, but we worship God the way He likes us to worship Him. We don't worship God our way, or our preference, or our style. We worship God the way He likes us to worship Him. And just now, I already mentioned, God wants us to give Him extravagant, Love, extravagant worship, extravagant love. But when we come to worship, do you know that the Bible actually gives to us the ways that God likes to be worshipped? It is given to us in the Word, in the Scripture, in the Psalms, in the New Testament. And do you know how many ways are given to us or how many expressions or forms are given to us of worship that God enjoys? There are at least 21 Turn to your friend and say, wow, that's a lot. But we worship God not our way, but the way He wants. So I'm going to quickly mention to you, okay? So that when we say extravagant worship, what do we mean? How do we do extravagant worship that pleases God? And these are some of the ways. And there are 21. The Bible tells us about using our voices. Everyone say, my voice. The Bible talks about lifting a shout. Let's lift a shout. The Bible says, make a loud noise. Let's make a loud noise. So those of us who, during, before service starts and we say, come on, if you love Jesus, make a loud noise. It's found in the Bible, okay? The Bible says, lifting our hands. It's, a, it's the way that God loves us to worship. Now listen to Pastor Roland for a while. And, I, and, and this is not to ridicule you or make fun of you. You know, when we lift our hands, many of us, our hands are like lifted very halfway kind, like very low, right? Very uh, low. We don't want to lift our hands all the way up because maybe we are shy. We don't want to be overly expressive, not extravagant. Now listen to me. Just now I had a very funny thought. Everyone lift up your hands, okay? And, and all of us here, we, okay, come, come here. Show, show me, show me, show me. And you can lift up both, lift up both, okay? Now, almost all of us here, we are able to lift up our hands all the way to God, right? Right? Unless if you have some physical uh, issues with lifting your, both your hands, that's understandable. But most of us can. Now listen to Pastor Roland. This is, so, this is so simple to understand. Our hands are made to lift up all the way. Right? So when we come to worship, why do we just lift up our hands halfway or like at our pockets? Listen to me. If God made our hands to be lifted up all the way to Him, then we lift our hands all the way up to Him. Amen? Amen. And, the, and the pastors always say to us, when we lift our hands all the way up to Him, it expresses surrender. It expresses our desire for Him. Like, Daddy, Papa, I want you. Or like, I, I surrender to you, God. Right? Right? So listen. When we come to lifting our hands, let's lift our hands all the way up extravagantly. Okay? And just now I had a very naughty thought. Should I tell you? If you keep refusing to lift up your hands all the way, God may just then decide to change and let your hands only come up to this level. And then next time, teacher asks you, who wants to answer that question? You, can you lift up your hands? I can't. <laughs> okay. But jokes aside, some of my staff, can okay, put down your hands. Thank you, I see. So many people receive Jesus today. Okay. 
some of my staff would know that I've been suffering from a frozen shoulder condition on my, on my left shoulder. Is this left? Yeah. Left shoulder for almost two years. And jokes aside, just now during worship when we lift up our hands, and people probably notice, I can't lift up this arm fully because it's very, very painful. Very, very painful. So even for me to put up my arm to this level now, it is excruciating. It is very, very painful. And just now during the time of worship, when the worship team was leading us, I tried to lift up both hands. I couldn't lift up my left arm. And there's, some, there's a tinge of sadness inside me that says, God, I can't lift up this arm fully. I still can lift up my right hand fully. So you will see me lift up my right hand very high. But this one, I can't do it fully. If I push and force it, it can, but it would be very, very painful. And of course, I'm praying that it will not, the frozen shoulder will be unfrozen. And there was a tinge of sadness in my heart and say, God, wow, I wish I lifted my hands up more in the past when I worship you. Because now I do not know how long will this condition be. Maybe, and I don't pray for it to happen, but maybe I can never lift up my left arm fully to you anymore, God. So, my point is this, lifting up of our hands, we lift up fully. Amen? Amen. Number four only. God wants us to worship Him by clapping, <laughs> by dancing. Oh man, I got to tell you a story about dancing. Dancing, right? When I first came to FCBC, I was shocked. Because I saw the pastors dancing on stage, jumping and dancing. And you know Pastor Kong, when he dances, he can spin around one. Okay? And, and I told myself when I saw all that, when I first came to this church, I said, dancing in my stuff. I'm never going to dance. It's never going to happen. It's not going to happen to me. I'm going to find scripture that, tell, that speaks about against dancing. Okay, I'm going to find... I'm going to find uh, and I just didn't want to dance. And the, the root reason is that I was very self-conscious, right? And I said, I don't want to dance. I am not sure whether I can jump. You know what? If I jump and the stage break, you know, what will happen? I'm not going to die. I'm never going to happen, okay? And the, and the Lord shows me there's this sense of self-consciousness in me that I will not want to dance, and for some reason, and some people may know, but this has many, many years ago, um, I, got to, I started to lead worship in church, okay? And even when I started le leading worship in church, I said, I'm not going to dance. God, I'm not going to dance. God, I'm not going to dance. I'm not going to dance, okay? And, and, and the Lord showed me my heart. It's because you're self-conscious. You're worried about what people think of you. But my word says, I love my people to dance in my presence. And one day I said, God, please help me. I really, really do not want to dance, but if it pleases you, I will dance. So during one of those worship sessions and people were dancing, I, I suddenly found myself started to dance and, I, and my feet got lifted up and I started to dance and I just felt a sense of freedom. I just broke free and I said, hey, I can dance, all right? Oh, man, all right? And I just started to dance. I started to jump and there was a freedom in my heart. I said, God, wow, you know, and... And, and, and there was an important truth for me that day. Number one, listen to Pastor Roland. We don't want to dance, we don't want to lift up our hands, we don't want to clap because we are worried about what people will think of us, correct? Let me tell you a truth that I found that day. Listen. People are not thinking about you, lah. They are not thinking about you. When it comes to worship, no one cares about you. They care about Jesus. Amen. And, and I was set free to dance. I was set free to jump. I was set free to dance. Amen. And last week, when we, when we were up here um, at the closing of worship, I was right here. And I was jumping and I was dancing. I think some of you lost to me. You know, I lasted longer than you. Okay. And, and it was so interesting. And, but that sense of self-consciousness just broke. And I just danced in God's presence. And then you tell this very funny thing. Okay. And after I started to jump, started to dance and lead worship. And, and when I lead worship, I always would jump, always would dance in Expo, in Touch Centre. One day, someone came up to me and said, Hey, Pastor Roland, that was a great worship that you led. Wow, then I was like really proud, like, yeah, anointed, right? Especially my dance, right? And I said, I love the way you sing. I love the way you lead worship. And I said, whoa, whoa, come on, tell me more, right? And this person said, you know, Pastor, when you were dancing and jumping up and down, Wow, it really looked like a big ball. 
And I was like, that experience totally killed all self-consciousness in me. It broke me and I said, God, it's great that he said that because it doesn't matter. All right? And if I'm a big ball bouncing up and down the stage, I will make sure I roll over that guy. No, just kidding. <laughs> but I want to tell this. The next time we come to dance, the next time we come to worship, the next time we come, we, we, let's, let's break that self-consciousness. Okay, so let's move very quickly. Dancing, processions, which are marches, twirling, leaping, standing, bowing, kneeling, singing, woo! the psalms, which is using the written word, the hymns, which are like older songs, uh, may are composed out of tradition, spiritual songs, are we singing? The, yeah, singing with, singing with other tongues, new songs, young people listen to Pastor Roland, okay, and I want to say this to you, I encourage you to write songs to God, come on, go ahead and make some noise, write songs to God, okay, and there are some of you, you know that you can write songs to God, write songs to God, okay, and some of these songs, we will sing it at our services, the song of the Lord, playing musical instruments, worship God with that, blowing trumpet, okay, banners, and silence. Some of you say, Pastor, number 21 is my favorite one. Silence, right? Now, silence is one of it. Be still and know that I am God. Silence is not the only way, okay? So don't come to youth service and say, Today I'm going to worship God the way He wants me to worship Him. It's called silence, all right? I will make sure I unsilence you. Now, not in this list. Not in this list is sitting down during worship. Not in this list is folding arms during worship. Not in this list, listen, is going to toilet during worship. Not in this list is looking at our mobile phones during worship. Not. But there are many, many forms that God loves when we worship the Lord. All right? I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to move very quickly. So we talk about our personal devotion. We talk about our corporate worship. And these are forms of worship that helps us, that shows God our extravagant love. Now listen, don't do all these clapping and shouting, etc. If, if in your heart there's no sense of extravagant love for God, don't do it. But if there's a sense of extravagant love, we will do it. We will shout, we will clap, we will lift our voices, we will lift up our arms to worship God. But listen, Matthew 22, 37 to 39, the Lord says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. In the New Living Translation, it says, the second command is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Billy Graham made this statement. Okay, listen, and we're going to close. The highest form of worship, he says, is the worship of unselfish Christian service. The greatest form of praise is the sound of consecrated feet seeking out the lost and helpless. Listen, God wants us to worship Him extravagantly. We want to express our worship to God. We want to be disciplined in our devotion. But our worship is nothing if there's no Christian love shown to others. Our worship is nothing if we do not love those around us. And someone, a church put it this way, we want to obey the great commandment by fulfilling the great commission. So listen to Pastor Roland for a while. God wants us to worship Him, but listen, I believe one of the things that will really, really delight the heart of God is that we bring those that do not know Jesus to come into His house to know Him. Amen? And, and always, always, whenever we come, just look at the number of empty chairs there are, and some are even being stacked up because we have so many empty chairs, so many. And God says, hey, if you love me extravagantly, if if you know that my demand on you to worship is important, then you need to show this love that you have for me through bringing others to me 
so that my extravagant love can be given to them as well. Cultivating a heart of worship must include submitting our lives to do what's important in the heart of Jesus. And that is why the song, this, the, the, the lyrics of this song is so important. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love you like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause as I walk from earth into eternity. Our worship and our love for God is never complete until we bring others to God's love. Turn to your friend and say, bring someone to know God. Tell them that right now. Bring someone to know God. And if this place becomes just a holy huddle, we will never be able to please God. No matter how loud we shout, no matter how high we lift up our hands or how high we dance and jump, if we do not show others the love of God by bringing them to know the Lord, then our worship is incomplete. So how do we cultivate a heart of true worship? Firstly, we must live out the purpose of worship through extravagant love. Number two, we must lift out the practice of worship through extreme submission in the way we, we, we do our devotion, in the way we love others, in the way we worship when we come together as God's people. Young people, the heart of worship is all about our heart. Turn to your friend and say to them, the heart of worship is about your heart. It's about your heart. You know, a true story was told by this man and he was... Everybody just look at Pastor Roland for a while. All right, I'm going to close with this story. A true story was told by this, this man and he wanted to teach his little girl different parts of her body and different functions of, of her body. So the, the, the father played this game with the girl and he would pretend to use his hand and whew, I've taken out your eyes and he would ask the girl, hey, what are your eyes for? And the girl will say, Daddy, Daddy, my eyes are to see. Okay, correct. Pew, pull back her eyes. And he'll pretend to take out her ears. What are your ears for? Some of you say, tell the daddy you can't hear him. No, just kidding. <laughs> what, are, what are your ears for? Daddy, Daddy, my ears are to hear, to listen. Correct. Uh, what are your, what's your mouth for? Daddy, daddy, my mouth is to talk, my mouth is, is to sing. Oh, correct. Right? And then the, the father will, will go on to do uh, whoosh, your brains taken out. What's your brain for? My brains is to pass PSLE, you know. <laughs> my brain, my brain is to, to think. Great. Put back the brain. And he said, okay, now daddy is gonna take out your lung. Whoosh, what are your lungs for? My lungs are to breathe, Daddy. Give me back my lungs. I can't breathe. Okay. Then the father came to the last part and said, Okay, I'm going to take out a very important part of your body now. Boom, 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 boom. Daddy got your heart. What is your heart for? The daddy was expecting a scientific biological answer. But the little girl said, Daddy, my heart is for Jesus. My heart is for Jesus. You know, I heard this story so many times, but that is so true. That our hearts are for Jesus. Amen. Our hearts are for Jesus. It is not for anything else. And when we come to youth service, Every week I know I taught you a lot But if you narrow everything down It's about when we come Are we here to give Jesus all of our hearts? All of it Are we like that little girl Who is just so simple in her faith To say 
God or daddy or mommy, my heart is for Jesus. Why don't we just all close our eyes and bow our heads right now? My heart is for Jesus. And the Lord shows me that this afternoon, there are some of us here, our hearts have never experienced the love, the extravagant love of God. We have never felt God lavishing His love upon our hearts. And because of that, we are not able to respond to God fully in worship because our hearts have never received His, His love in a very real way, in a very extravagant way. Well, today, if that's how you feel, God wants to pour His love into your heart. Some of us here, the Lord shows me this afternoon, our hearts are unable to be given to Jesus because our hearts are fearful. Some of us, our hearts, we are unable to give our hearts to Jesus in worship because our hearts have been wounded, we have been hurt, and we, we are just trapped in that, in that fear, in that wound, in that pain. And we can't give Jesus our heart completely because He has been wounded. And these wounds cause us to doubt the love of God. These wounds cause us to think that, are you sure, Pastor? Is there really a God who loves me? I, I don't feel it because you have been so wounded, you have been so bashed up, you have been so hurt, and your heart cannot fully be given to Jesus because you have been so badly hurt. If that's who you are, the Lord says, let my extravagant love come and heal you. Let my extravagant love come and minister to you today. And there are some of us here, our hearts are hardened, it's so hardened. We can't love others. We can't love others. We are, we are, we are selfish. We are unable to give to others. If that's the condition of your heart, the Lord says, let my extravagant love come and set you free. And there's some of you here, our friends, you have never given your heart to Jesus Christ. You have never asked Jesus to come and live in your heart. Listen to Pastor Roland carefully. Your heart is for Jesus. And the truth of the matter is that all of us give our hearts to something. All of us worship something or someone or some things. But listen to me. If your heart is given to something else, whether material, material things or whether religious things, let me, let me tell you this. Your heart will never find satisfaction. Your heart will never experience true love if your heart are just, is just given to things that are apart from Jesus Christ. If you have never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, to come and live in your heart, this afternoon, Jesus says, your heart belongs to me. And He wants to come into your life to touch you and to, to fill your heart with His love so that your life will never be the same again. So if you have never given your heart to Jesus Christ, but today as you sat here listening about how much God loves you, and you say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to receive Him into my heart. The things of this world have just disappointed me. I feel so empty inside, Pastor. Can I, can I ask you to help me to bring Jesus into my heart? Yes, I want to help you. And this is how I'm going to help you. You have never invited Jesus Christ to come into your life. Follow me in this prayer that's designed to invite Jesus to come and live in our hearts. And as you pray this prayer with me, word for word and line by line, all your friends here in youth service will pray together with you. All right? So pray together with Pastor Roland right now with all our eyes closed, all our heads bowed. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Lord come Jesus. on everybody, ten times louder. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Dear, Dear Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus. I open my heart to you this afternoon. I open my heart to you this afternoon. The things of this world, the things of this world yeah. have left me empty have left, left me empty the things of this world lord the things, things of this world lord, have given me just nothing but pain have given me nothing but, nothing but this afternoon lord this this afternoon, i open lord, my heart to you i open, I open my heart to you and i invite you jesus to come in i invite you jesus i receive you into my heart 
receive you into come my heart. and live in me Jesus come, come and live in come me come and be Jesus. my best friend come, come and be my, my best friend. friend so that I can worship you so that I can, I can worship, worship you all the days of my life all, all the days, days of my life. life thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Lord with all eyes closed all heads bowed if you have prayed that prayer with me for the very first time I, I want to I want to know who you are so that I can bless you with a prayer so at the count of three, if you pray that prayer with me for the very first time, lift up your hands because no one is looking around except some pastors on duty. So if you pray that prayer with me at the count of three, just lift up your hands so that I know who you are. Jesus loves you. We love you. We are not going to ridicule you. We are not going to embarrass you. But lift up your hand to tell me, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. One, two, three. Lift up your hands. Say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. Just lift up your hands and tell me that you have done that. All right, yes, I see some hand back there is there anyone else just lift up your hand and say pastor i've done that father we want to pray for our friends who have responded to you we pray that lord you will just make this day a special one for them and cause their lives to be forever changed by the love of god the extravagant love of god for them we thank you we bless you in jesus name we pray and all say amen amen, amen. please stand please stand and as we stand can we give jesus a big mighty clap of praise and shout Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen to Pastor Roland, okay? I saw uh, some hands lifted. Maybe you were embarrassed. You, you were not, you're a bit shy. You didn't want to lift up your hands. But listen, if you prayed that prayer with me just now, even if you did not pray that prayer, but you know that you know that you know you need Jesus Christ in your life, after this service ends, just ask your friend who has brought you to uh, youth service today to bring you to the visitors' uh, area. And we want to connect with you. We want to, we want to, we want to become friends with you and get to know you. All right. And as we close this service, the Lord says to us here in youth service, our hearts belong to Jesus. Perhaps your hearts have been wounded. Perhaps your heart is just hardened. Perhaps your heart is just in pain and and you can't feel the love of God. Perhaps your heart is just doubtful. As the worship team lead us to sing. This is our response. If you want to say to the Lord, Lord Jesus, I want to come and I want to just come forward and stand here and once again give my heart fully to you to love you extravagantly, to give my heart fully to you so that my heart can be freed up for you and to live for you. Let's lift up our hands. Just allow me to pray for those who are in front. You can see many of you just tearing. The Lord is ministering to your heart right now. Where there's pain, where there's woundedness, where there's a hardness in our hearts. Lord, I pray right now that your love, your extravagant love will come and bring healing and bring restoration. Lord, I, I pray freedom upon the hearts of many of these young people who are being trapped in areas of their hearts, in areas of their lives. They are just being trapped in those things that are holding them back. I speak freedom to your hearts right now. I speak healing upon your hearts right now. I pray that right now, this very moment, God's extravagant love will be poured out over you. Why don't we all lift up one hand and the other hand place it over our hearts right now. And before I pray for you, I want you to just take a moment to personally tell Jesus my heart is for you my heart is for you Jesus my heart is to worship you my life is to honour you my life is to give to you extravagant love just go ahead and tell him that young people that my heart is for you Lord my heart is for you and for you alone I will give you worship God I will give you praise God I will honour you and I will delight you I will give to you extravagant worship Lord in my life Thank you Lord Father thank you for speaking to us And this afternoon we just receive Your great and extravagant love for us May we be a generation That will be extravagant in our commitment That will be extravagant in our love for you Lord Lord may we be a generation That will be extreme in our obedience be extreme in the way that we live our lives for you and may we be a generation that will love others with the love of God 
We thank you, Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, Amen. If you love Jesus, go ahead and give him a mighty, mighty, mighty clap of praise. Come on. Raise a mighty clap of praise. Raise a mighty shout of praise to Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 God bless you as you go. If you are a newcomer, you brought a friend to church, bring them to the visitor's area. And we will see you next week.